uh, how about now? Can you guys hear me now? Hold on. Can you hear me now? Or is there still no sound? Let's see. There's a little bit of a delay, and I'm gonna I'm gonna pull it out in one second. Why would there? Of course, there's like issues with this. Okay, hold on. Uh, I'll figure this out in a moment. I promise. Hi. Let's try this again. I fixed it. Okay, cool. I didn't even realize. Uh, there's just a very significant delay on here. Um, okay, well, let's get started. So, um, <laughs> you might lose the voice again, and then you can hear me again. All right. Cool. So, um, today we're going to be talking about a rather controversial uh, issue Obviously, I want to uh, I, I want to just bring in an expert on this subject. Uh, I'm going to be talking to Noah Colwin in a little bit. Uh, he is a really awesome dude. You might recognize him or his voice at least from the uh, Fortnite games that we play together on my Twitch at twitch.tv slash Hasanabi. Uh, Noah is a UC Berkeley graduate. He is the senior editor of Jewish Currents. And uh, he's a journalist based in Brooklyn, New York. And before he started writing for Jewish Currents, which is a thought culture and activism uh, of the Jewish left magazine uh, that specializes in news and features, uh, he uh, was the technology editor for Vice News. Before that, he was an associate editor at the technology news site Recode. And his writing has appeared in Book Forum, Vice Magazine, and elsewhere. He got a BA, a Bachelor of Arts in uh, in Political Economy from UC Berkeley. So he's a he's a Berkeley leftist uh, Jew. So uh, that gives you a little bit of a briefing on his background. Um, his Twitter is at uh, at Noah Colwin, I think. Uh, so now I'm just gonna wait for him to get on so I can uh, help him or I, so I can bring him on board. You just you need to write something, Noah, so I can bring you on to the stream. Just so you know. Anyway. Noah Culwin, it's N-O-A-H-K-U-L-W-I-N, Noah Culwin. He is Ben Shapiro's nightmare. Oh, there he is. Okay, here we go. All right. So, right now, hopefully his, uh, his internet connection is good, so we can have, like, a conversation together. Um, it's going to be difficult. difficult. We're, I'm still... I'm still working on it. Whoa, what's up, Noah? Howdy. What's going on, man? All right, so first of all, I didn't realize that you had such a powerful beard. I, like, <laughs> the photos you have on the internet, um, you yeah, know, I don't have you quite don't have beard. A, such a big beard. Um, well, oh, it, it, uh, it looks a little... Oh, what? You go, go I was on. just going to say that it only looks this, this much because of how hot and humid it is in New York right now. So. Oh, yeah. No, I heard. I heard it's absolutely <laughs> terrible in New York. And it was raining, and then your, your, your subway system completely breaks down every time it rains, which is funny because people always make fun of us here in Los Angeles. Whenever it rains, like our entire public transportation, like our whole traffic system is broken because uh, we can't handle the rain. Turns out... New York isn't capable of handling the rain either. Figures. Anyway, um, so uh, everybody, like, I already briefly, met, I already uh, gave an intro to Noah, but, like, he's one of those people, he's great at Fortnite, first of all, which is very important, but he's one of those people that is e incredibly intelligent, like, way smarter than I am on a, a multitude of different subjects, so I'm just going to... And, and a great writer as well. And I, I linked his uh, his work earlier um, when I was promoting the live stream. But you guys should definitely go check out uh, Jewish Currents after this discussion is over. But without further ado, let's get started. Noah, give us a little bit about your background before we get into it fully. Sure. So um, I'm an editor at Jewish Currents, which is a 72-year-old uh, Jewish magazine. And um, it's uh, I'm part of like a group of folks who's... Uh, recently taken on leading the magazine, and it was founded by Jewish communists in the 40s. And we are working to, you know, 
we, we hope to live up to that legacy. And so we publish not just uh, with sort of news stuff, but we also focus on culture uh, in both our coverage and publishing po poetry and fiction. And um, we also spend a lot of time talking about, of course, Israel, which sort of leads to the news of the day and the nation state bill. Yeah. Um, you're, you guys are, would you say you're to the left of Haaretz, right? Is that? Uh, I think we're like, Haaretz, I think is sort of like, you know, they're a news publication um, and they like their critics love to say that they have a left leaning bias, but I would say we're sort of just like a different animal entirely. Um, you know, we don't okay. like, we're, we don't really take a position as like a publication um, as like, you know, like, we're not like a Zionist publication. We're not like an anti-Zionist publication, but I, we're definitely of the left. And um, I think our editorial perspective sort of bears that out. Yeah. The long, the long uh, tradition of, of Jewish uh, anti-fascism and communism lives on in Jewish currents, I feel like, which is one of the, one of the re many reasons why I, I think it's awesome and important. So, Let's get started. So you wrote a piece about the latest decision in the Knesset, as you told me. Um, I didn't know how to spell it. I mean, I didn't know how to say it at, uh, before Noah uh, uh, luckily explained to me how to say it correctly. But yeah, so you wrote a piece on the latest decision in the Knesset. You want to you wanna tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, absolutely. So the nation state bill is something that has existed in some form or another since about 2011. And the core of it is that it's, it was a proposed... Um, addition to what are called Israel's basic laws. Israel does not have a constitution. Instead, it has what are called these basic laws, which sort of enshrine some of the things a constitution might. Um, they're sort of comparable to the like amendments of the, to the U.S. Constitution. And so the nation, the nation state law, as it is now, um, basically what it does is that it reserves the right uh, for self-determination to be a right that is exclusively possessed by Jews. And that means, uh, in effect, in Israel, that Jews are, um, they have more rights than Palestinians. And they have more rights than other indigenous peoples uh, to the country, is how Palestinian uh, advocates put it. Um, and this law is, which has sort of been um, promoted and heavily uh, championed by Israel's right wing, um, which controls the Knesset, actually passed by a relatively slim margin, um, a vote of 62 to 55. And the law uh, sort of codifies some stuff in Israel that, is, that wasn't official, but was sort of de facto. And then it reaffirms some other things that are already official. And then it actually makes some changes. So one of the changes that it has made is that it has downgraded the status of Arabic from an official language to that of like a special language or something. And as for the right of self-determination, it suggests that it means that uh, Palestinians um, do not enjoy the same kind of liberties and freedoms to, you know, uh, as Palestinians in a future state that they would otherwise get, because Israel is a land that is only for the Jews. Um, and predictably, this has caused a lot of controversy inside Israel and outside. Yeah. Um, and you said, I think, I believe it's what, 5% of the population currently is uh, Arabs? No, no, no. More than 5%. More than 5%. More than, it's a fifth. Than a, I mean, it's yeah. a fifth. Oh, it's a fifth. Sorry, more than a fifth yeah. of the population of Israel currently is uh, comprised of comprised of Arab individuals. They don't necessarily have to be Muslim either. They're they're Arab Christians as well. I know this seems like rudimentary information, but uh, this is something that a lot of people are unfortunately not very very aware of. So I I always feel the need to describe that a little bit more. So um, I feel like this is more of a this is kind of a, a, an. A, an evolution of right-wing extremism that is happening all around the, the world. And I feel like you kind of tied that back to, uh, you had a, uh, some opinions on that as well. Um, right? You, you were talking about ethno-nationalism. Yeah. The resurgence of ethno-nationalism, especially from uh, a Hungarian perspective as well, because the current Hungarian prime minister is now visiting Israel, and he's quite the controversial figure. You want to yes. talk about that a little bit? Yeah. So one of the things that this sort of nation-state bill, um, it, it fits within sort of a constellation of other initiatives and maneuvers from right-wing politicians to, uh, like, like to stake out like an ethno-nationalist claim. Um, and it, with Israel in particular, you know, you could argue that the occupation and the foundation of the state were already sort of premised on this kind of ethno and the right of return, which allows Jews from all over the world to make, uh, to, you know, to immigrate to Israel. Um, 
you see similar uh, initiatives in places like Hungary and Austria. And it's especially crazy because these are governments and parties that often actually have ties to, you know, actual Nazis, not just neo-Nazis, but the original deal. And so it's, you see this kind of ethno-nationalist wave emerging all across Europe. And it offers sort of a rejoinder to the European Union and to attempts for, to make these societies more pluralistic, more accepting of refugees. And it, this kind of nativist rhetoric allows the sort of autocrats in these countries to consolidate power and to find, you know, an other to blame and everything. And so in Israel, you see sort of these new alliances being formed with leaders in Europe, like, um, like Austrian Chancellor Sebastian Kurz, who visited in June, the same week that they expelled, uh, like moved to expel a bunch of imams from, um, from Austria and closed down a bunch of mosques. And then you also see it in, uh, in Hungary, where, you know, like, uh, where the president Victor or-, or Prime Minister Victor Orban has talked about um, Muslim refugees as Muslim invaders, and you also see it with connections uh, in countries that aren't in Europe, like Narendra Modi, the uh, leader of the government in India. He is very close to the Netanyahu, and they had like a very big public, uh, like Modi had a very big uh, public, uh, pub- highly publicized visit to India, and Modi is also a, like a Hindu nationalist. And so you see in the nation state bill a kind of ideological convergence with all these other like nationalist movements around the world. Um, why do you think that and this is somewhat of a broad question, but why do you think that there is uh, this resurgence of, of uh, nationalistic movements worldwide? Is it uh, just because I think part of it is obviously uh, like routine Islamophobia that is genuinely broken a lot of people's brains for some weird reason here in the united states like like educated liberals even but then on top of that i feel like maybe just maybe it could have something to do with global capitalism and the economic devastation it's caused and and also globalism uh like anti-globalist sentiment uh worldwide what's your what's your take on that i mean it's it it draws from a number of sources economics are a part of it And in Israel specifically, there's an enormous number of social divisions across racial and economic lines. Um, For many, many years, Israel has been sort of, I don't want to say ruled by, but its leadership and the power has been held by an Ashkenazic Jewish elite, uh, you know, of Jews descended, of European descent. And people from, you know, Jews of of, uh, Mizrahi descent, or who come from places like, who's uh, like, Um, parents or grandparents came from places like Morocco, Iran, um, Tunisia, um, these and uh, Iraq. These are people who have been more marginalized in Israeli society. And this kind of nativism is sort of directly meant to appeal to them without addressing, of course, the economic uh, deprivation that they experience um, across Israeli society. And so I think that you, when you look and you try and examine and talk really concretely about all this, um, it's really important to recognize that this is used as a tool for Netanyahu and other members of the right wing to kind of consolidate power and to prevent any meaningful opposition from arising. Like it's, it's meant to like nativism is a cynical political tool meant to uh, draw these people in. And then, of course, there's also a real ideological conviction. In Netanyahu's case, his father is actually a like widely known uh, Jewish historian who and and was affiliated with the uh, with a guy named Zev Jabotinsky who was one of who was one of the right wing sort of um, like like Zionists active in Israel um, prior to the formation of the state and he was a political rival of the people who actually created Israel he was a rival of Ben Gurion and the Labor Party but still very influential and very right wing and very nationalist and very aggressive and militant in you know attacking Arabs and stoking violence. And so I think with the right wing Netanyahu government, you see this um, like like you see these kinds of nationalist tendencies as both a, you know, sort of like political ploy, but also representative of like real ideological uh, convictions that they have. Interesting. Um, on top of that. So do you think that we briefly talked about this before on, on my Twitch uh, when we were playing video games. So like I <laughs> didn't, didn't get like a, like a really uh, well-rounded take from you on this, but um, do you feel as though 
um, like right wing reactionary, uh, right wing reactionary movements have really taken off in Israel, and and even exacerbated in the last uh, twenty years, like last twenty to thirty years. Yeah, or, I mean, there's, has this yeah. always been a part of of uh, like ever since Israel's formation? Has this always kind of been there, and we're just kind of, we're just seeing it more now because of the internet. I mean, it's I, I, you know, it's a bit of both. There was massive displacement of Pal there was widespread displacement of Palestinians and expulsion and murder um, during the like during like Israel's you know what they call the war for independence in 1948. That is very much a part of Israel's history. At the same time, since Israel's right wing first came into power and in government at the end of the in 19 in the late 70s you sort of saw like the steady creep of right wing like nationalism becoming part of like normal israeli political discourse and in the 90s after the oslo accords when israel and the palestinians came to an agreement about limited self government for uh, palestinians in the west bank and gaza you ended up sort of with this kind of divergent trend where you know, Israel seemed more committed, at least um, from the outside, to having peace talks and, and embracing the idea of a Palestinian state alongside Israel. But at the same time, you saw rapid settlement construction. And you saw it when Bibi Netanyahu first served as prime minister in his first stint in the 90s, you really saw the emergence of this kind of really powerful right wing force that combined um, the settlers, it combined nationalists, it combined previously excluded and marginalized um, Mizrahi Jews, like I discussed before, and also the ultra-Orthodox. Ultra-Orthodox Jews who have their own set of concerns and don't want to relinquish, relinquish any control of the religious uh, institutions in Israel or of function, uh, core functions of the state, like uh, giving wedding, uh, wedding licenses, for example, so, or marriage licenses, for example. So I think that you sort of see this nationalism kind of emerge, and then it reaches its zenith, in uh, over the last few years um, under the tenure of Bibi Netanyahu. The Knesset, since he first um, took power and formed a government, because there it's a parliamentary system where you have to form a governing coalition in the legislature um, to take power. Um, since 2009, um, Benjamin Netanyahu has had, like, he's had increasingly right-wing Knessets to work with. And they have pushed and agitated for all sorts of legislation and laws and rules to try and um, you know, limit uh, Arab re representation, to intensify control over the West Bank, and to, uh, I mean, what, are, what can only just be described as anti-democratic measures. And I think the nation state bill is sort of the, uh, it's like the apotheosis of all those maneuvers. You see it, um, and, and it's one that's also starting to turn heads from people who previously kind of stayed quiet or only offered um, tepid, tepid criticism of these kinds of moves in the past. Like you see uh, American Jewish groups like the Anti-Defamation League, the American Jewish Committee, the Union for Reform Judaism, who probably aren't going far enough in their criticism, but are now at least saying like, well, this seems like a really bad idea, and we're a little uncomfortable because of it. Um, and part of that is because, of course, it hands over power to people who don't really think high, highly of Jews who don't live in Israel. So there's a lot of like tensions that I think are now sort of being raised. And it's also making a lot more people more comfortable with using the apartheid word to describe what's happening. Yeah, um, I mean, that's a yeah, in a, in a lot of ways, while delivering something that conservative Jews have wanted in Israel, potentially, uh, he's also uh, Netanyahu has also set the arena perfectly for uh, an apartheid state uh, similar to what's happening in uh, what happened in South Africa. Uh, well, the other thing I was interested in finding out more about, and this is, uh, and I want to get to the Israeli-American Jew connection in one second, but before before we discuss that, the other thing I wanted to say is like Netanyahu, from my very uh, like cursory understanding of what's happening in Israeli politics, um, there is a there's a growing wave of even more nationalistic uh, Jews to the right of Netanyahu. And one of the primary challenges, if I'm not mistaken, used to in the 90s, at least uh, be uh, uh, was uh, was Netanyahu's liberal opposition. Uh, I forget what her name is right now. God damn it. I was looking for it a, a second ago. I, and and this to me is uh, is telling about uh, how how um, politics worldwide has kind of shifted to the right. And um, my fear personally is that uh, the younger generations 
as we pre uh, are not going to be as progressive as we previously thought, specifically as uh, American Jews, uh, uh, in regards to their approach to Israel, um, and 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 Palestine. What do you what do you have to say about that? Do you know what I'm talking about? Do you know who I'm referring yeah, to? Yeah, I, I, totally I, I mean, I mean, I I would say that like to, just to zoom out for a second, I do believe that younger American Jews do not feel um, the same kind of warm and fuzzy ties naturally that their uh, parents might have toward Israel. And part of that is because young American Jews are broadly young and liberal, and liberals in America are like becoming progressively less and less enchanted with Israel. At the same time, I think in Israel, among younger generations, you see some really scary trends of um, like, you know, like anti-Arab racism, um, nativism in general, and a lot of resentment towards, say, refugees from Sudan and Eritrea who are in the country. And this, this like burgeoning generation, um, there are a lot of political parties that they can get funneled right into who are way to the right of Netanyahu. Or not way to the right, but to the right. Um, one of the parties that... Not, uh, Netanyahu's Stevie pretty serves to the right with, already, so being to the right of him yeah, is, is remarkable. I mean, you're talking effectively about... Yeah, you're talking about settler parties at this point. So one of the most powerful parties that's in, his, uh, that's in uh, the governing coalition with him and from which a lot of uh, his government's ministers um, come is the uh, Jewish Home Party. So this includes people like Naftali Bennett, who's the Minister for Diaspora Affairs, um, which means that he's the minister in charge of dealing with Jews from around the world. And also the Justice Minister, Ayelet Shaked. And these are people who are really, really radical and have, a, and have an increasingly... Uh, of an increasing amount of power. And many people fear that it's from this group that once Netanyahu uh, leaves office, I mean, he's coming up on 10 years in power, that eventually when he leaves office, it'll end up being somebody from that pool who will become the leader of the country. And that Israeli youth, you know, those who don't leave because of an increasingly unequal economic environment or who don't find an ability to make, the, to make themselves home and feel comfortable... Uh, in living in a country that is becoming increasingly illiberal and undemocratic, that they are, you know, you're going to see more and more people driven into the arms of the right wing, which is bad for Israelis, sure, but will, of course, be even much worse for Palestinians who live under Israeli occupation in the West Bank or under Israeli blockade in Gaza, because it only means that the, like, systematic deprivation that they endure is only going to get worse, and it's only going to become more entrenched. Yeah, um... That's so I obviously uh, was it's almost impossible to draw an identical parallel to um, what we're experiencing here in America uh, or uh, the national the ethno nationalism worldwide. Uh, but the reason why I always try to draw these uh, comparisons, even though they're they're simple and sometimes may even cause disservices so that uh, people here in the United States can easily identify and understand um, uh, situation, uh, the situation abroad, because. I have a lot of Jewish fans who uh, have gotten very upset at me over my criticisms of Israel. And, um, and I think that you could potentially draw some parallels in between what's happening here in the United States with, uh, with our uh, borderline uh, proto-fascist right-wing uh, uh, leadership and, and uh, exacerbated income inequality. I don't know. It, it, you, I feel like there's more of a... Um, there's more of a... Obviously there's more of a divide between uh, different sects of, uh, of Jews in living in Israel. Uh, so that's a, that's a different uh, demographic makeup completely. And, and then uh, the, the nature of the Israeli state. But um, I don't know, is there, is there any way that you could draw a comparison? Is there any way that you could help with that uh, in regards to, I mean, in regards to what's happening here in America to draw some sort of parallel so you, that people can, uh, I mean, I, 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 you know, my simple answer to that would just be like the short answer is follow the money. And the second answer is that uh, the longer version of that is that like part of what has facilitated the rise of this right wing in Israel is the fact that you have, you know, entrenched in the American government at all levels across both parties, a group of people who are perfectly comfortable and with 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 what's been happening in Israel. Like these are, you know, take Chaim Saban, for instance, one of the largest Democratic donors um, and who owns uh, media companies like Univision and is probably most well known for bringing the Power Rangers to the U.S. Um, he's somebody who can, who's like an aggressive Zionist, but has sort of translated that in his support for Israel to be kind of like 
to, at least in American politics, to stifle any meaningful criticism from within the Democratic Party. And so what you see is this like rise of nationalism and this illiberal and these illiberal tendencies and discrimination against Palestinians and Arabs across society is sort of fueled by a lack of concern in the U.S. And that lack of concern, I think, has sort of been mirrored by mirrored. Um, with the lack of concern in the U.S. for the like sort of rising trends of racism and white nationalism in the Republican Party um, and in American politics more broadly. It's the kind of thing that people didn't realize was happening until Donald Trump ran for president, even though the Republican Party and the Republican base that elected him was there all along. And so to my yeah. mind, there's like those are sort of like they're, they're not di- they're they're not directly related, but there is absolutely a connection. And I think that it's, this, it's not dissimilar to the connection that you see between Israel and what's happening in Hungary and Austria or even India. Yeah, that's, that's perfect. I think that, that kind of uh, puts it into simpler terms that are, that's easily identifiable, especially for like um, for liberals in the, in the audience that, that uh, are sometimes a little bit more um, sensitive when it comes to uh, criticisms of Israel. I just um, I have no way of, of, of trying to figure out whether or not uh, young uh, American Jews are, are more uh, conservative in regards to Israel. But that's just my personal speculation. Uh, like, that's what I've seen, at least. And, and I, I don't know. I feel like that might be a little biased and I, I, I might be wrong. That's kind of what I was trying to figure out. Um, I don't know what your take on that is or if it's even a possible if it's something that is even remotely possible to talk about um, with empirical evidence. But I don't know. What do you think about that? Well, about like younger Jews, like with a more like having a more conservative bent in that way. Well, not not in Israel, not even in Israel. No, no, in America, toward Israel. Yes. Yes. towards Israel. So. So a lot of the research that's been done, like that sociologists and others have sort of found is that for people who have um, traditional institutional affiliation or more um, uh, observant religious beliefs, like pe- like there's still a degree of attachment and belief in Zionism that I think we would like that we would just call a more conservative or right wing. And then for the majority of young American Jews who um, of those who do care to have an opinion or a perspective, um, Many of them, I think, are kind of d- discomfited by what's been happening and what's been going on. And that sort of that discomfort um, arises from the fact that Israel just m- increasingly is more and more visibly illiberal and does not conform to the values that they have, which in American politics broadly translate to, you know, your kind of standard liberalism. Um, the majority of Jews have voted for Democratic presidents for many, many years now. And, you know, in spite of every year, like, you know, the Republican Jewish coalition saying, well, this is going to be the year because the Democrats are increasingly worse on Israel. That actually hasn't translated. Um, and so I think well, the Democrats like, also haven't really been increasingly w- worse on Israel. From my perspective, I, I feel like I've been pr- fairly objective uh, in our criticism. If you look at uh, Chuck Schumer's uh, APAC, famous APAC speech uh, from last year, I think, or this year, uh, this year, he had he exhibited uh, some elementary school like uh knowledge over over like israel's right to to jerusalem and 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 statehood uh by by citing the torah and the fact that israel's uh uh, the greatest threat to israel's existence is the fact that arabs don't want uh israelis to be there and it's uh i don't know i think that's a very simplistic approach and to me that's indicative of how uh a lot of Democratic Party members uh, uh, take a look at uh, Israel, like how biased they are uh, when it comes to Zionism. And we briefly saw that, I feel like, this, and this is the, the last thing I want to ask you about. Uh, and I don't know if you want to talk about this or not, but what do you think about, uh, you know, Cortez's uh, stance kind of changing a little bit, or maybe she misspoke uh, uh, in regards to Israel yeah. and Palestine? I mean, so I'll say, like, up front, you know, like her answer on the firing line, um, the PBS show where she said she believes in Israel's right to exist. Like, it's it's a silly question, and she gave a silly answer. But it's also, I think that her follow up responses, and she said she did, and I think it's a silly question because you don't ask people if France has a right to exist. Like, it's it's just a, it's a, <laughs> yeah. it's like, 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 do you believe that like a chair has a right to exist? Like. A right to exist is like it sounds like a pro life argument. It's not. It's not an adult like question without any seriousness behind it. It's a way of um, sidestepping 
like ongoing political realities for an imaginary philosophical conversation about whether or not a state like Israel should have been created. And that is a separate conversation and one that I'm not going to get into right now. But I do think that her follow up answers were really fascinating, specifically when she said that, you know, she's still learning. But it was the groups that she said she's learning from that really like kind of shocked me in a positive way, because first she cited J Street, which is sort of the conventional liberal Zionist kind of answer to this. But she also said Jewish Voice for Peace, which is a like which is, you know, a group that openly talks about apartheid in Israel. And they're filled with many smart and eloquent people who have been totally neglected by the Jewish and American political mainstream over the past number of years. And I think that that's really, really something that you have like political candidates who are willing to talk about education that they are getting on this issue from groups like JVP. Um, that's a real major step forward, especially when you consider that the Senate, that the you know Senate Minority Leader Chuck Schumer, the most powerful Democrat in the in the in the Senate, is somebody who I watched when I was at the APAC conference this year get up on stage and give what was easily the most right wing speech on Israel of anybody I saw. And that includes Mike Pence. I mean, it's it's really yeah. it's like it's to even see Ocasio Cortez take this on and acknowledge that she's learning and soliciting perspectives from groups like JVP. It's just it's a breath of fresh air. Yeah, um, it's it, that is interesting. I didn't even know about the second group that you mentioned, um, and I'm going to look into it more as well. Uh, all right. Well, thank you so much. Is there anything else that you want to talk about in, in regards? to No, nah, just that my my or? beard. I mean, uh, I think we covered it. I mean, I just want to apologize for my beard looking this poofy and uh, for a shaky camera because I am using a phone because my no, MacBook's camera I, I sucks. Know, I know. <laughs> I'm, I'm, really, I'm really fortunate that, that uh, you agreed to come on. Seriously, thank you so much for coming on and describing this stuff because um, obviously I, I don't have a fraction of the knowledge that you do uh, when it comes to this. And, um, you know, it's, you're, you're a great Fortnite ally. So uh, I, I look forward to you getting back on uh, getting back on the stick so we can play together on my, on my Twitch and then we can talk more about these sort of issues. And I'll bother you by by uh, duping you and telling you that we're just going to play Fortnite and then kind and of. And then we'll just yeah, uh, we'll just talk about Israel, Palestine. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I mean, we don't only we don't only have to talk about that. There's plenty more to talk about here. But yeah, thank you so much for coming seriously. And, and, and no problem. Educating people. Thanks All for right. having Is me. Is there anything you want to plug? Uh, please subscribe to Jewish Currents. You can check us out at jewishcurrents.org, um, and there's subscribe buttons all over the page. You can get an issue, you can get a subscription, uh, with four magazines a year for $18. That price isn't going to be around forever, and it's a really good deal. And check out our website and follow us on social media. I mean, pretty easy to find us. And, um, we have some really, really great stuff coming out. You're really going to want to subscribe before we release our summer issue. Hell Yeah. Thank you so much, Noah. Thank you. No problem. Take care. All right. Bye. Really intelligent, who are very well versed. They 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 live and breathe the stuff that they cover. And um, what I want to do is is basically uh, promote people like that as best as I can and use my platform so that you guys can go follow them. And uh, thank you for joining. And look forward to my latest video today, which won't be about Israel, uh, but uh, it's actually going to be about. Wow, I forgot. Oh, yeah, money's influence, money's corrosive influence on legislation and the, uh, the recent uh, steps that the Trump administration took with the IRS in hiding uh, dark money donors. So look forward to that a little bit later. Peace.